Thank you for having me again. Uh, this will be the third time that I'm sharing um, since uh, the Devi Parashakti Darshan on the first of this month, so nine days ago. Beautiful. And maybe to our viewers, uh, you can give a brief of what Devi Parashakti um, uh, revealed to you, what was her blessing to you, and then we can move into your share. Uh, if I can read it, Ma, it will be yes, please, easier please for go me ahead. to. Okay. Uh, okay. So on the 1st of June, uh, Devi Parashakti answered my question after many, many weeks. I had never um, had an answer before, despite having asked the questions. So when this happened, it was um, an, a very intense, moving moment for me. And this was the answer that Devi had given. Listen well to what is being told, daughter. You are one of the beings who came down from Kailasa to be a co-captain and serve the world to protect it from the terrible corona. You forgot the purpose of coming and diverted into another life. Such beings as you who came from Kailasa are also the reasons for this terrible pralaya. Forgetting the divine seva you need to do and leaving the work you are meant to do. You are doing some other work. Like you and other such beings who came from Kailasa have become the reason for this great drama. For three days, think about what I told. I will make you realize it in your dream, waking state and consciousness. I will show you the truth. Once you see it, I will give Prayaschita. Go and come a virtuous one. So this, this answer to me was just, um, it was very intense because the moment this came to me, this answer, it just, it hit me right in the gut. I knew it was the truth. The moment it was said, I felt it. And then I sat with it and I, and I waited and I allowed the words to sink in. And it has taken these number of days to realize just the kind of the weight of the responsibility and uh, what we've come here and the purpose with which we're supposed to be here. And I think when uh, Devi Parashipi said, you know, just I will reveal things to you. And I will tell you what you need to do. The way um, when I heard it, the way I see it is, you know, really reawakening to the true purpose of your life, you know, realigning us back to the real purpose of our life, which is what will give us fulfillment. That is what we came to this planet Earth for. And when we drift away from the purpose, she gives us a strong wake up call and realigns us back and tells us, you know what, this is what you came for. And when she shared this with you, Arthur Prima, what really went inside you? What was the experience that you had? And what was the realization that came from the you? So, Ma, I'll, if I can go back to the beginning. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. if I can share that um, my meeting with Swamiji, when I first met Swamiji, this happened in 2004. And I was in Oklahoma City at that time and um, in the U.S. And I had graduated from college, I was looking for a job. And this was about 17 years ago. Um, I was 21 years old. And this I just saw a flyer on my aunt's table. And she invited me to attend uh, the temple in Oklahoma City. And I went and the moment Swamiji stepped out of the car, not knowing anything about him from the past, I just knew that I knew this person, that my being automatically recognized something and something shifted within me, which I didn't even understand at that time and that moment. And from then on, life just took on a different color. It, it had, I had purpose. There was, there was so much peace. There was so much joy. There was an intensity. Um, and all those words, these words are actually pale in comparison to what that feeling was like. And it was being around Swamiji and being initiated and having the darshans, everything was just auspiciousness unfolding. Every second it was manifesting. And just being in that breathing space was auspiciousness. It was um, everything that un unfolded. It felt like you were living not on earth, but on a different plane of existence. So each time... Um, leaving that space in his physical presence was so unbearable. And it was very hard because 
you felt like, okay, I want to be around the master. I want to be around the guru in his physical presence all the time. But at the time, a few years later, I, I moved back to the place I was born and grew up in, which was in Dubai, in the Middle East. And um, I would often go to, I'd go to Adi Kailash and, you know, uh, attend various programs and get, get you know, the, um, uh, the teachings and understandings and being in that breathing space. And every time I had to leave, it was like this, this separation was so hard. It was so unbearable to leave that space of Adi Kailash. But also knowing that everything that I was, had imbibed from the teachings, it was important for me to go out and go back and do that seva and, and just share with the people who were in the Sangha in Dubai at the time. And uh, all they wanted to do was you know, listen to the stories and the, the sharings and just taste that the joy and the bliss and, you know, and enriching was just, it came with so much ease. It was just a natural process that all of us just kept doing. So at the time, I, I didn't even realize what was happening, but I was, I took up the responsibility of uh, the Sangha in, in the Middle East and in Dubai specifically. And at the time, I was about 24 and the youngest coordinator for the mission at that time. And wow. I can't say like I like I can't say that I knew anything about Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma. I had, you know, I grew up in Dubai, a Middle Eastern country. I, I, I didn't we would the most we had exposure was when we would visit India to visit our family and go to temples. But beyond that, there was not much understanding. Um, so I didn't have any depth of knowledge around Vedas or Shastras, or I, and I couldn't chant. It was not like I could chant and everyone was impressed or anything like that. It was, there was no prior knowledge and or experience before meeting Swamiji. So all that I came back to share every time after those visits to Adi Kailash was just sweet, simple stories that was just shared from intense bhakti, that, that devotion, that sweet devotion that comes through you um, just by being, you know, just being in that oneness with Swamiji. And every time it was like a cloud that kept me floating through everything that I encountered in life, whether it was through work, through relationships, through the Sangha, everything. It was just such a beautiful flow. And just having that simple devotion, that simple trust, and just taking that simple action, the response was so incredible. You know, the satsang grew, um, the sangha grew. And our, the, the satsangs that we were hosting in, in devotees' homes, um, every week we would have satsangs that would keep moving from different devotees' homes because everyone wanted to host it. And we could not no longer, and many of the people had not even met Swamiji. And uh, there weren't too many things happening on social media at that time, unlike today. And people would just come because that bhakti was felt. And we had to form a center legally and officially. Um, and in that center, we would have our Nitya Yoga, we would have our satsangs, we would have our youth group meetings. And eventually, uh, a Kalpatru happened in, in, in January of 2010. And this was just created by a handful of people who felt that deep connection to Swamiji. You know, so why I'm saying all this, Ma, is because kind of to give a little bit of context and background to yeah. what has happened, where I've come from and what happened in between. So during this time, um, now this was now six years with Swamiji, um, being so closely associated, there were a lot of questions and I was 21 when I met Swamiji. And so there were a lot of questions with from family, there were doubts raised, you know, why do you need to have a guru? You are too young. Um, when will you get married? You know, you're getting older. So there was all this pressure from the society and to my parents specifically. And it was hard to be able to convey, uh, convey to them just what having a guru and having Swamiji in our life was like. I mean, the countless blessings, the healings that had happened. It's too, it was too many to share. And it was, it, all we did at that time was just continued on and, and just turned you know, deaf ears to what they were saying, because I knew the person I had become and 
the shift that had happened in me was so obvious to my family and then to my friends and people were drawn to that and wanted to know who it was that i followed that kept me so much at peace and so centered with such unwavering faith despite any sort of ups and downs one experiences in life whether it's through job or or relationships uh, they could just see that it was with such ease that i was flowing through life and i felt it and i felt swami ji's presence with me all the time so what happened after all of this was that in june of 2009 a group of uh, core devotees from dubai the dubai sangha we all attended the inner awakening program and uh, we attended it together it was such a beautiful um, 21 days and then we some of us extended our stay because we weren't re- weren't ready to leave and it was that time that um swami ji after much of us asking and hoping and praying swami ji announced that uh, there would be plans to come to dubai and uh, host the we could host the kalpa through program for for about 2 uh, days um it was the plan for swami ji and some of the uh, senior swamis to come and uh, and and come to dubai so immediately after we returned to dubai we you know we work was underway we had to organize we had to plan we had to make so many arrangements um you know we had to raise donations and manage an entire program and we didn't know how many people would come we were just a handful of us i mean it was this, satsangs were there but we weren't sure how many people would actually attend and so with all of this we just surrendered you know surrendered to that moment and said with absolute trust and devotion we said it will happen swami ji has said it now it just has to happen we're just part of that process and then people started registering uh, donations started coming in and it all just unfolded so beautifully you know that surrender and that whole process was just we could see the divine play in all of that so the you know receiving swami ji hosting the kalpa through having so many senior swamis in attendance was really like literally a dream and something we would never thought could happen in in a place like dubai and especially in the middle east so it was a successful program over 500 people attended from different parts of of the middle east and uh, you know riding on this high of the experience uh, we some of us were planning on attending the kumbh mela so which is the you know biggest religious gathering and you know we were thinking what better way is there to experience a, a a spiritual gathering like this than with one's own beloved guru so this is now all the background and leading up to then what happened next was um i was to take a flight um on the 3rd of march in 2010 and uh, head to bangalore and uh, come to adi kailash and uh, with a group of people you know uh, get together and then go to kumbh mela with swami ji and just before taking the flight i got a call from one of the devotees in dubai and they said that there has been some news that's broken out and um, i think you should be aware of it because you might consider not going not going and taking not taking the flight and not going to india so i heard what he had to say i i understood that there was what it what was happening but i didn't pay attention to it i said no this is decided i'm i'm going to go so um i arrive um the morning of march 3rd um and and now india has it's early morning so a lot of india hasn't woken up to the news that has just come out uh, on 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 tv in india and as i arrived to adi kailash that feeling of excitement and you know building that you know okay we're going to i'm back here i'm back home and um, i saw some people outside the campus and they looked like reporters so okay i i didn't think much of it and i thought okay maybe this is related to whatever the news is so go into the um campus and find that everything is very silent everything is so eerily silent actually just couldn't see anyone um i i i passed a devotee devotee on the way who was responsible for some of the temple activities and i asked him um he was a devotee in dubai who moved with his uh, wife to 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 be at the temple and uh, take care and he said the temple wasn't open so i thought that was quite strange you know so but i thought okay let me go and maybe it's still too early and let me go and register 
at the admin office and then just do all the formalities around you know checking in and everything so then we um we congregated like a, for a few of the foreigners and everyone who had arrived um got together in the food hall and then we were hearing bits and pieces of information and we weren't sure what was happening but something was going on but we were kept safe and we were told to be in a secured location and you know at in time uh, we would be given some more information and later on we heard that the gurukul had been set on fire by a mob of people and Even so that was the exact same day of prema just to let all of you is know that was the day when the you know the religious persecution on supreme court of india was just uh, 24 hours before had come out and the swamiji was going through a series of assassination attempts and and it was the residents of the supreme court of hinduism um, you know being burned um, along with gurukul and along with so many other places with supreme court of being locked inside the own monastery and that was being like a recast it and all this was happening and the people who were there i was there in the adinam on that day and none of us were allowed to you know go to protect swamiji or protect any other parts of the place and all of us were cordoned off completely and there was a complete police who were actually protecting the anti hindu elements to destroy the monastery and they were not allowing us to go stop or do anything and that's exactly when i think you were also there happened to be there in the monastery at that same time yes please go ahead yes ma and at the time we didn't know what was happening but of course much later on i i understood but at this moment in time it was it was very um disconcerting you know but we were in, it was ensured that we were all kept safe you know all of our you know um, we were kept in a place that nobody could um, reach us and it was it was you we felt secure we didn't feel threatened by any way but we knew something big was was happening so that night um two devotees from the city uh came and you know whisked us away actually from from the campus saying that there has it's it's getting out of control there's a lot of people and you know you need to we need to take you back into the city and be safe your parents you know are worried and and all of that so we were put into a car we were asked to remove all any sort of um, anything related to swami ji we were asked to remove the mala the, the bracelet everything everything that you know was was part of us we had to just kind of remove and keep aside so that in case we were stopped along the way that we were not harassed or or bothered so we get into the city and all the the news channels are incessantly airing a video over and over and over and it was just i'd never seen anything like that being done with such consistency it was as if that was all every news channel could could do and and report on so it it had the effect of of visually affecting people you know and i decided at my parents insistence that i should return to dubai and not remain in india longer and i did that and and then i felt confused and i didn't speak to anybody you know and and i neither tried to reach out to the administrators of the um, adinam uh, adi kailash nor did anyone contact me because so much was happening at the time and they were all trying to keep themselves protected as well and so i kept a low profile for months and and this was right after a, a hugely successful kalpathru program that had happened in january of that just a two months before um i mean literally it was january and now we're talking about march and people are expecting to hear information and now this has happened so i i didn't know that to you mark to me mom because i was there in the monastery at that time and you know we were we were just trying to ensure swamiji's life was safe you know see swamiji was going through a serial um, series of assassination attempts and over a span of about from the 2nd of march to um 21st of april just in that one month and one and a half months his car was followed everywhere swamiji was, was at least had about i think more than 70 assassination attempts just in a month and a half every place there were people who were ready to you know burn him alive ready to um, kill him ready to uh, you know do all sorts of things and it was it was all and with the police protection means the people who came to attack they came with police protection for them um you know so there there is no way we could do anything so the whole um, administration at that time um was focused on somehow we want to just somehow ensure swamiji's life was safe you know that was that was 
what was there for us. We just wanted Swamiji to be alive for what he was doing to humanity and what he has done to humanity and what he has done to all of us. That was what was going on. And we really couldn't, you know, expect this level of a multi-pronged attack from every side. And I remember on the 3rd of March, there was an inquiry from 11 government, uh, government departments trying to, you know, shut down the bank, trying to shut down the monastery, trying to shut down the Gurukul, trying to shut down the temple, trying to, um, you know, get all of us out. I was there and we were literally forced to leave. They said, no, 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 everything is closing. You have to leave. All the Adinavazis, we were forced to leave. Um, you know, the bank accounts were getting frozen. Um, Swamiji was being attacked every, everywhere, every step of the way. And that, that, that was what was going on um, in India at the time, you know. Just to let you know, and for all the for all our viewers also, you know, at that moment, this this is continuous airing of this um, false news, um, so much of hate speech, and everywhere people are you know barging into the monasteries and temples and breaking the deities and and um, abusing sexually, like uh, female monks getting sexually abused, and everywhere it was just completely out of hands. Even if we have had the best of the administration, you know, it was just possible to handle the attack that was happening from all directions on um, you know a small group of uh, people who are trying to manage and, the, and that most priority at the time was we wanted Swamiji's body to be safe. Yeah. Yeah, yes, Ma, and, and what uh, shocked me the most, and I didn't even think in too deeply about it, but what hit me on the surface was that it wasn't just in India, but everywhere. It was news channels in, in Dubai, in the Middle East, and, and everywhere. It was seemed as if it was now looking back, what a coordinated attack that it had all happened in this particular way and in such a huge, um, uh, in, in such a way that really affected everybody. And I know that so many people, I mean, the monastery was affected. People were trying to figure it all out. And um, it was a very uh, disconcerting time. And um, uh, newspapers in Dubai were calling me for a statement um, you know, I was contacted by the person implanted in the Sangha responsible for, for bringing this whole thing in to, to uh, this whole thing out was just, uh, was started trying to contact me and seek, seeking some sort of a, like, I don't know, support or monetary help and insinuating that his life was in danger. And, you know, so the media contacted me in Dubai, then this, this person who was implanted in the Sangha was contacting me. And then I was getting questions about whether I was involved in questions about black magic. And, and it was, and I would end those conversations and I, I retreated further and further um, away from uh, the Sangha, you know, and even the Sangha in Dubai, I, I just kind of, I, I was confused, didn't know what was happening and just decided I would just be quiet and silent. And somehow felt that fearful. And, and I thought because I was single, I was unmarried, I may be a target for attacks next. And I couldn't afford to have my parents or my family in any way affected. So I, the, I just kept away. So for one year, it was like I didn't even want to see the news. And I didn't even want to look at what was happening. I didn't follow anything that was going on. And or all the attacks that were happening on Swamiji, on the Sangha, on the entire monastery and what what they were trying to do. And a year later, um, it was like a almost like a post-traumatic stress uh, response for me one year away from uh, my guru, who I, I had been so closely connected with for six years. And I just kind of and the cognition that I had at the time uh, was that I felt abandoned. I felt, um, you know, I, I I dropped everything and I just felt like, okay, I, you know, Swamiji is gone. I'm feeling abandoned. And in turn, I abandoned the Sangha and, and Swamiji, you know. So I just thought, okay, now this is what, what life is. And let me just do what everyone in society expects one to do, which is continue having your job, you know, live your comfortable lifestyle. And, you know, I was encouraged to settle down, get married. And my life just took a 180 from there on. It went in a completely different direction. And I didn't realize that that action, how much damage I was doing to myself, because 
I had a responsibility not just to the Sangha in Dubai and to Swamiji, but to Sanatana Dharma, which in hindsight I can see now. And I just thought I allowed myself to override my judgment and, and, and logic took over and it, it logic took over and I just denied all the experiences I'd had until then, you know, experiences that defied logic and all the love, all the compassion, all the protection, all the immeasurable growth, the healing, everything that I'd had experienced was just compartmentalized and put aside. And I didn't revisit it for 10 years, you know, and I didn't at that moment now, I didn't stand for the principles. I didn't stand with conviction, that simple devotion, that simple trust. Um, I just abandoned it and, and buried it, you know, and I felt that the action at that moment in time, I didn't feel complete with it because I did feel a responsibility towards the Middle Eastern Sangha. Um, I had the opportunity to help the Sangha ride the wave of uncertainty till things became clearer, you know, till the dust settled and we actually could find out what the truth was. And I didn't, you know, so my reaction and then the lack of my any action somewhat indicated my acceptance of this false narrative that was being spun around Swamiji and the Sangha. And it wasn't until March 2020, which is just last year, did I really understand or realize the magnitude of the persecution and the magnitude of the attacks on Swamiji and how repeatedly the Sangha uh, was under this attack and um, false allegations and and inside me, when I found all of this out, and now all of 10 years, I've kept an information blackout. And I didn't know any of this. And when I heard it, it unfurled in me a need to want to protect and stand, you know, and and just this, this feeling of wanting to be like a, a warrior. And what I had not done in those 10 years, I was feeling like, this is what I need to do now. So... The years that I was away the, uh, from the Sangha and Swamiji, those 10 years, um, I had repeated visions of Swamiji. And in those visions, I would go and ask, why, why did this happen? You know, and each time it was the same thing. And, and in that, Swamiji would say, come and see me. So I ignored those visions for several years. And then in 2017, right before I had my son, I had the vision of the banyan tree calling me. And then I knew um, that somehow I needed to return and be in the presence of the banyan tree. So then I we, we had the opportunity. It un, unfolded in a way that was, again, be, defied logic. We happened to come to India after many, many years of being away. And... Um, one of the devotees who had been initiated into third eye powers did a body scan for me. And at that moment, the message to me that she got was, come and see me. There will be no hangover of the past. And those were the words exactly that I'd had in my visions all those years before. And the moment those words were said, I knew this was the time. And when they, they suggested that, oh, why don't we go to Adi Kailash? My immediate response was yes. And then immediately the rest of my family, my parents, my sister, my brother-in-law, all decided with, that we would go. And what what stood out to me in all of this is that um, in these 10 years that I felt like I had separated, um, Swamiji was there every step of the way. He was trying to reach me through the visions that I had. Um, any experiences that I'd had through my life in those 10 years were, that were challenging, there was a strength within me that I didn't realize I had. And looking back, I know that strength was Swamiji, you know, and, and despite me pulling away, that umbilical cord connection that you have with the Guru, that spiritual umbilical cord, as far as you may go, that will always remain connected. And so now I can see in all those moments in those 10 years, just how Swamiji played such a role in my life to ensure that I didn't fall. You know, so 
those those trying times there was strength in those in all those challenge challenges i was guided i was protected and i just i felt like i i didn't like swami ji will never make one feel guilty or anything like that so it wasn't that i i felt like there was a responsibility i had towards the middle east and sangha i didn't stand for that but now is the time the opportunity has been given back to me that i can stand for it and when i was given my spiritual name in 2004 it was already a strong indication um nitya atma prema which is the spiritual name i initiated to me in 2004 was an indication of my purpose and this is where when i was living my purpose is when i felt the most alive and when i strayed far away from the guru the sangha and altered my path there was so much um incompletion and i would often share with members and of my family that i didn't feel like i had my purpose and the only time i ever felt i had purpose was when i was doing work with and seva uh for 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 swami ji and now thinking that the life that i'm living maybe i'll find that purpose through a job a different kind of project or through marriage or through having children you know i but still there was something inside that was just unfulfilled and the moment we stepped back into adi kailash on in january of 2010 those 10 years just melted away it felt like we were coming home and that um just knowing that it was with the guru's grace that we had that opportunity to come back and no matter how far i went away you know the guru's hand was just always there guiding protecting and ensuring we that i have this second chance and so when devi ma um gave the message and said the reason for the pralaya is due to forgetting the purpose and diverting from the work i was meant to do i felt it i felt it deeply and although 10 years may have passed and the divine grace has pulled me back and it's offering me a second chance and what's important now is taking up that responsibility and standing up and and actually living the purpose and al- aligning with that cosmic will now so it's not about regret it's not about feeling guilty it's it's about coming to alignment and finding that completion and moving forward um in alignment with that purpose with powerfulness and and the responsibility is 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 large and i never want to take that for granted because i know what anti elements have been working now tirelessly for 10 years uh, incessantly attacking uh, sanatana dharma uh, uh, swami ji the sangha the entire to co- and the question is why they why why is this this constant attack for 10 years and i never want to let somebody else determine the purpose of my life because the the purpose is clear and already those 10 years showed me just how much i had missed and how deeply unfulfilled i felt and this was the this is the chance to to regain that that and and align myself and devi ma strongly revealed what my soul felt and now to live out that purpose is the ultimate gift that has happened with the guru's grace so so this is a long sharing ma <laughs> and but i wanted to but give context this this is so much he that sharing because you know what it was it's not just you you know there are maybe hundreds of uh, you know devotees that are out there who became victim of the persecution victim of a persecution of uh, not just in terms of a direct attack but victims of a persecution where the right information that was not given the victims of the attack in the sense where you know the people who are also whose life also got impacted because of the religious persecution and attack on swamiji and it's important that 
when you realize it, it took you 10 years to realize and maybe there are so many that are still out there and who still have not realized and who are listening to your sharing and who realize oh god this is exactly what i felt as well you know one side you have the the wealth of experience as well swamiji which is our own experience we know it, our inner being knows it our consciousness knows it we have felt it we know swamiji yes and every single devotee who has seen swamiji who has been touched by swamiji has that wealth of experiences but what happens sometimes um you know we may call it delusion or we may call it whatever name we want but that wealth of experiences like you said got gets compartmentalized and we get consumed by something else that's out there and it takes us a while for us to spring back and realize oh god you know these were my experiences with swamiji and i had them i know who swamiji is and i know what this is and it wakes us up and the sooner we wake up it the sooner we realize the purpose of our life and and that's why it's very important mahatma prema the people like you when you know who were um the victims of the anti hindu attack on swamiji and which that led to you separating yourself from the guru and now you realize oh god you know that's the time i should have been there and and you know stood a strong warrior for becoming being a uh, warrior for sanatana hindu dharma warrior for swamiji warrior for kailasa but you know now that's what devi has awakened you know i can see after the you know the devi parashakti sakashi kidding how much it's it's clicked in you and how much it has um, revealed to you that you know what this is what has happened and and i'm so glad you're coming forward and sharing it for the benefit of others um, you know countless others that are out there uh, because the hate speech on swamiji was you know spread all over media everything was spread all over media and so many one of the things i wanted to ask you was um, you know the anti hindu elements they tried to Uh, when they were wanting to falsely um, implicate swamiji um in the in so many cases right hundreds of false cases were slapped on swamiji and one of the things is they approached so many um anti hindu the anti hindu elements approached so many female disciples and devotees of swamiji and inviting them to be false witnesses um becoming the false victims and where you approached um you know to be a false victim or to be they they tried to pull you in into this whole attack against swamiji yes ma i it was a clear indication that that was what i was being asked um not so subtly because they contacted me and were trying to get me to be involved in this and to support their cause and i immediately sensed that this is not where i am this is not at all the space in which i am in this is um and i slowly retreated away from you know the contact with these people and and i and i didn't want to upset or anger but i just detached myself from because that was not at all there was not even a moment to think in that way and and to even to be even approached about such such a thing was just unbelievable for me so Please. from all the love the, sorry ma please from, go ahead so from all that was was showered on us you know to even consider that was out of the realm of of any possibility so um i think they understood that and also trying to uh, get some sort of monetary support and and all of that so it was i can see how many would have been affected the same way that i was and and i was lucky it was only just 10 years there may be some people who uh, it may be longer and i hope not because um if you are having that call just listen to it because that is the call from the divine saying come back you know this is for that completion I had i and i i i don't want to think about what would have happened had i not and and i that i wouldn't be here talking today and sharing this in that moment i never thought like a f- few years later i never thought that this would be where i would be sitting today and talking and even discussing this but i think so many people may be in that pos- in that same position and allowing these attacks and this abuse and persecution to to affect their spiritual growth and progress and that would just be the saddest saddest thing exactly and and at the end of the day it's a loss for us 
it's a loss for each individual because if you are losing your you know you are the more and more we are distancing ourselves from the guru the more and more we are distancing ourselves from the true purpose of life the more and more we are distancing ourselves from what we are here for because it is the guru it is swamiji who awakens us to the true purpose of life makes us realize and experience fulfillment and the moment we move away from the guru we move away from who we are what we came here for and that can never give us fulfillment right you can go and do so many different things you can have the best of the best businesses the best of the families the best of uh, you know job and relationships and wealth but that's not the best of you so whatever you do you know it does not give you that fulfillment you know that is a deep lack that is something that's missing and you know that that is the divine call like you said you know there are so many visions that happen you know swamiji is there for you and you know that was where we need to come back to and i can tell you every single devotee who uh, you know was a devotee of swamiji and was a victim of these um, el- um attack of these anti hindu elements would also um, know that there has been a deep call they just need to answer the call you know answer that incoming call from parameshiva and realign ourselves to the true purpose of life and one of the things that you also shared mata prema i wanted to bring these anti hindu elements you know like how they approached you and wanting you to become uh, one of the you know the false victims and that's what they have done they, you know they have approached so many um, you know uh, female disciples of supreme pontiff and wanting to somehow trying to use them to become a false victim of swamiji right so if somebody is let's say for example somebody is really affected i would be the one who's affected because i'm affected i'll go in and maybe complain somewhere but nobody needs to come and tell me oh you know what why don't you come and falsely implicate so the very intention of the anti hindu elements is very clear and you know because they approached you to be a false victim yourself so all of us should realize that the the, the whole um, ecosystem the anti hindu ecosystem which was trying to attack swamiji trying to falsely implicate swamiji trying to assassinate him trying to slap these hundreds of false cases is a huge persecution against sanatan hindu dharma and because like swamiji in a very uh, satsang sometime back he said i am being attacked because i am standing to protect sanatana hindu dharma i am standing up to protect all of you and that's why i am being attacked you know he is standing up to protect the enlightenment ecosystem he is standing to protect and revive sanatana hindu dharma and that is why he is attacked but sometimes delusions and the illusions that we live in our mind does not wake up to the reality of what's happening out there and we end up losing or moving away from the purpose of life and even at that point it is only the you know the, uh, the uncomparable compassion of swamiji even then even when we distance ourselves he reaches out to us and he awakens us to the true purpose of life so beautifully shared mark of prema is there anything else that you would like to share about your experience just um to share from this last this past year um to you know from 2020 to today um 2021 the the exponential and uh, okay let me just say this i i live a life that's very comfortable i've lived in many different countries i've got the opportunity to travel live with all luxuries um uh it, it there's nothing that i am wanting for in life yet there was this deep unfulfillment that now in this past one year with swami ji is has just been immense growth spiritual growth um evolution a uh, healing completion um immeasurable there there are things that i could share that are unbelievable for other people to uh, and in this one year what what has happened has been you know like it, this is how life around swami ji is it's just exponential it's just that super conscious breakthrough after breakthrough and the cognitions and the and everything and and i'm sure many people will will attest the same obviously and that's not something i can even imagine having missed and um the opportunity to be back and to not and the opportunity to realign myself and get and and come back to the true purpose is is something i would i really pray for all the others who were victims of this of these attacks so good to be shared martha prima thank you so much for coming live and sharing your experience with um everybody and uh, thank you so much i don't know what else to say it's just been like you know it's not easy for somebody to come forward and share so openly you know what they have gone through and how you have been a victim of this attack and which separated you from 
who distanced you from the purpose of your life. And now with Devi Parashakti's blessings, with Swamiji's blessings, I'm so glad that you realized you're back and you wanted to realign and become a part of Swamiji and Sangha. Thank you so much for uh, coming forward and sharing, Madhavi. Thank you, Ma. Thank you to Swamiji Nityanandam.